I'd like to share a very short video um, that is an interview with two of our volunteers on the Hospice uh, Cortland Foundation. And they went through this experience, two friends that volunteer together for our organization, went through the process of making their own death binders. And I really think their story is a great way to kick us off tonight because um, they have some really great things to say about their process. Gail doesn't plan on dying anytime soon, but she's making some preparations for when she won't be around any longer, and they're all in this binder. I wanted my family to know everything about me in one book. You name it, I have it in here. It's called a death binder, and it's a place where you can put all of your important documents that you use on a yearly basis so that after you pass, your family knows where everything yes. is. It's all kinds of things. I mean, my grandmother's, my great-grandfather's. Gail went the extra mile, adding in photos and descriptions of the family history of heirlooms she has in her home. I have tried to talk to people about doing it, and you either get a affirmative, no way, I'm not doing anything like that. But many are really interested in doing it. Gail says she adds things to her binder every year, like insurance and taxes, making sure it's always up to date. I really cherish that picture. This is my great, great grandfather. Gail thinks having a death binder is really important, but she admits it was uncomfortable to put together. Uh, here you are planning your death. Um, and that's something that you really don't look forward to, but you know it's going to happen at one time and you just want to make your children happier. So what do you put into a death binder? Well, Hospicare recommends the top three things are medical documents, financial documents, and digital information like passwords. Barb is another volunteer with Hospicare putting together her own binder. Basically, there's only two guarantees in life. They say our taxes and death. You know, it's something you start thinking about. I have tried to have a hard conversation with my daughter, and she, her reaction usually is, can we just not talk about that right now? So if I put it all in a notebook such as this, we won't need to sit down and talk about it, but she'll have the information that she needs. It's not really for me. It's more for the people I leave behind preparing now to make their family's saddest day just a little bit easier. Crystal Cole, Spectrum News. Great. Okay, Wendy, are you ready for the next part of the presentation? I am. Okay. All right, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our How to Make a Death Binder uh, presentation. Um, as you learned from the short video that we just watched with uh, Barb and Gail, uh, a death binder is a place uh, where we gather all the important documents and information that we think are going to be needed so that our wishes will be carried out the way that we want after we've passed. That was in the next slide, Sarah. Sure. Um, so then why a death binder? Uh, as the title of our workshop says, and as Gail and Barb also explained in the video, um, putting together a death binder is really a gift to our loved ones. Um, it'll, it'll make it easier on our loved ones once we've passed. And it is the number one reason that motivates people to, to do this project. Um, but it is also a gift to ourselves. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to, to review our own life and um, in the process gives us the opportunity to maybe make some changes that we might see. Um, it's also um, a concrete plan for our family to follow, which hopefully alleviates any surprises. Um, it gives all the information in one place, and in doing so, it allows family members to provide each other with the emotional support and opportunity to bond, rather than spending time on the details that have already been spelled out in this binder. Um, and finally, if you are sick when you're putting this together, it gives family and friends the opportunity to be supporting you and being a loving presence for you at the end of life. 
rather than searching for all of this information. So as we move forward to make a death finder, you're gonna to wanna to set the intention. What does that mean? It means asking yourself some questions, some hard questions like, how do you imagine your end of life experience? What medical or life-sustaining care do you want? Who are the family and friends who will most be impacted by your death? And finally, what do you want your legacy to be? So after spending some time on setting this intention and asking yourself some of these questions, next slide, Sarah. Um, once you get ready to start, it's important to, excuse me, to set some realistic goals. You don't want to pull your hair out. Uh, you want to find out what works best for you um, and then just enjoy the process. So the Death Finder is a place for us to leave a paper trail um, or a digital trail. Uh, it's a place for us to gather all the important documents and information, as I said, that can be readily available should there be a natural disaster, a medical emergency, or a death. Um, as you can see from the list, uh, there's many different kinds of documents that can be included in your binder. I'm going to review some of them by category. So our first category is medical documents. Uh, some of the important medical documents, so I'll just read through the list here, are health insurance policies, a list of your physicians, including telephone numbers, a list of any health diagnoses, a list of allergies, a list of medical procedures with dates. So these are ones that you may have on an annual basis or have just recently had uh, that were because of your illness. Um, you also want to include a list of your surgical history with dates, a list of family medical history, a copy of your healthcare proxy, a copy of your MOLST form, and a copy of um, a five wishes document or another similar document. So a couple of the more important medical documents that I named are the healthcare proxy. Uh, this is a legal document that's gonna designate um, one person who will make healthcare decisions for you if you're unable to. Uh, because it's difficult to know all the choices that need to be made in an emergency situation, it's important to name someone that you trust and know that they know you and your core values. Um, you're going to write some of the scenarios um, on your healthcare proxy or perhaps in your five wishes, like having a DNR or uh, on do not intubate. But again, you can't know all of the possibilities. So it's really important to really trust the person that's making those decisions. And then you want to make sure that all your medical providers have a copy of this healthcare proxy. The next form is called a MOLST form. It stands for Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. It is a um, a document that's filled out um, with your doctor and it outlines the wishes for end of life in the event that you can't make the decisions for yourself. Um, if you don't have a healthcare proxy, then this form will guide the medical decisions that are made for you. And if you do have a healthcare proxy, this document can guide them on some of the more specific choices on your behalf. Organ, eye, and tissue donation is something that many people are interested in um, doing after death. If you are interested in something this, like this, you can fill out an organ donation card, and it's something that you can carry in your wallet. Um, and in New York State, you also have the choice of listing that on your driver's license. Um, and then finally, there's what's called a five wishes document. 
Uh, there's similar documents to this one as well. Uh, what they do is they help you think about the medical, emotional, and spiritual questions that may affect the decisions you make um, about end-of-life care. So then after looking at these questions, it can help you uh, have conversations with your healthcare proxy, um, other medical providers, and your own family. So if you would like a copy of the Five Wishes document, there'll be a link to request one in, a, in the follow-up email, or you can email us directly at info at hospicare.org to request one. So that's all your medical documents. Um, the next category of documents to think about is legal. Um, these include wills, trusts, birth certificates, adoption records, business ownership, marriage certificates, divorce or separation papers, drive, copies of driver's license, employment records, military service um, records, passport, citizenship or immigration paperwork, um, social security cards, all of those can be included in your uh, death binder. Um, next, you're gonna wanna think about and gather documents for your burial plans and final preparations. Um, again, this can include funeral home information, burial or cremation information, a burial plot deed if you bought a plot, um, memorial or funeral service wishes. Sometimes people want to include a favorite song or a specific reading. Um, and, and then other people like to include obituary ideas or even a written draft of an obituary. So then there's many more documents beyond this to think of as well. And honestly, the more the better more you can include for your family, the easier it's going to be for them. So some of the other documents that you may want to include would be household property or possession documents, or even pictures like Gail had included in that you saw in the video, um, insurance policies, personal information like contact numbers for family and friends, pet information, uh, any personal history records that you want to pass on, and usernames and passwords for all online accounts, like bank, bank accounts, cell phones, credit cards, email, online payments, healthcare portals, and social media. Lots and lots to think about. <laughs> um, and then after all the hard work of putting together those documents, you might think you're done, but as Gail mentioned, you, you need to keep these documents up to date, really. So you want to think about either picking like an annual date that you want to update your records or reassess your, or, and reassess your wishes and upgrade appropriate documents. Um, but you could do that either, like I said, by picking an annual date, or you could do something like every five years you're going to do it, or based on a life change, um, but you are going to want to keep them up to date. And that's it on my end. All right. Thanks, Wendy. Mm -hmm. uh, so Wendy covered those the medical, the financial documents, kind of the bigger picture, all of the um, things that you want to gather for your document. Uh, Wendy, will you just keep an eye on the waiting room? I noticed that there's someone in there right now. I sure will. Thank you. Um, so, but I just want to open it up a little bit and say that this is your project to own, right? This is something that you get to create that is a representative of you and your life, and you get to design it any way that you want to. So you might use a binder for this project, or maybe you're more of a box kind of person, 
or a bag or a filing cabinet. You know, we called it a death binder workshop, but really it's up to you how you want to organize your documents. The important thing is for you to find a system that ex is exciting to you and that makes sense for you so that you'll actually finish the project. And like Wendy said, our intention is very important with this project. Our why, the things that we put in our, um, the chat box at the beginning of the webinar, why you're doing this project is really important to stay connected to that because that's what's going to give you the um, motivation to do it. Because let's face it, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to talk and think about our own death or an emergency situation, right? Um, so another way that you can make your intention about the project known is through a letter of intent or instruction. And this is something, uh, it's an informal document, it's not your will, but it's to guide the ex executor of your estate or your loved one um, when they, with important information, it's kind of like a roadmap for your death binder or your death box or your death filing cabinet, however you want to think about it. Um, so I, I put this at the beginning of my death binder and it's kind of a letter to whoever finds it um, and is processing it, but I also wanted to, to represent me. So I included one of my favorite uh, Mary Oliver poems and a John Donahue poem at the beginning of my death binder because I thought that that would be nice for whoever was um, carrying out with um, the, the, the exec execution of my estate, so to speak. So this is a picture of my mother's binder. Uh, my mother made a, a do-it-yourself binder. Um, and a couple of years ago when she started putting this together, she would mention it to me and it would make me feel very uncomfortable. I would think to myself, why is she talking about her death all the time? This is so morbid. I don't want to talk about this. Um, but then she kept up, you know, kind of gently and consistently bringing it up with me. And then I started to really understand it uh, in a much different light. And instead of shutting down or being uncomfortable with the topic of conversation, I really started to welcome the conversation and recognize that in fact, my mother was giving uh, this death binder as a gift to me because she had been through it with her parents and she really wanted the experience to be much easier for myself and my brother. Uh, and I just want to share that with you because when you're having the conversations with loved ones, you might come up against some resistance at first. I was a classic example of that, um, but through your own intention and you know your care for your loved ones, I think that eventually they'll come around and be more open to talking about this topic. Uh, and I love my mother's binder. It's got birds and flowers on it. It's very representative of her. She's a birder and a gardener. Um, you can see she has her five wishes there. And then she's got her binder divided into tabs um, before death, at death, will, financial, et cetera. And it's all handwritten uh, in her handwriting, which is Wendy has pointed out before that that's such a nice, um, very tactile part of my mother's binder um, that I'll have a sample of her handwriting. Uh, I went uh, a little fun with my binder. So I'm just holding my binder up to the camera. It's sparkly and has uh, unicorns and galactic stars on it. Uh, but it's just a simple, you know, one and a half inch binder that I got at Target and I bought some color dividers and that's what I'm using to create my binder. So the DIY binder is really fun. It's kind of like a scrapbooking project. Uh, you can be as creative as you want with it. And then other options out there are ready-made organizers. So there's lots of things that you can find on the interest on, uh, excuse me, on the internet, on Pinterest, on uh, YouTube, Instagram. Like people have been really creative with the Death Binder concept. And there's also a lot of ready-mades that you can purchase. So there's um, this cake is a website. So you essentially are uploading all of your information and it's organized on a website that your family members can access with your password from anywhere. Um, so that's a nice virtual option. There's also, um, you know, these are binder dividers and it has lists of all your documents and you can kind of fill out this prescribed um, forms. This one is a book format. So I just wanted to draw your attention that there are a lot of ready-made options on the market if scrapbooking is not your forte. Um, and the other thing we want to consider is storage. So you're going to have to ask yourself some questions as you start to gather your 
materials for your death binder. One question that you want to answer for yourself is, do you want to keep the originals in the binder or do you want copies in the binder, right? Are you going to store your originals um, in, a, in, a, in a safe box, in a filing cabinet, or are they actually going to be in your death binder? I have kind of a combination. Some of my original documents are in my death binder while others are stored in a second place. Um, a lot of people feel better having electronic copies of their important documents. So that's something that you can explore, um, uploading them to a secure location as a backup, um, like or on a jump drive, cloud storage. Others are gonna be more concerned with natural disasters. Wendy has a friend who lives in Florida and you know the reality of living in an area that gets um, severe storms is that she wants to be ready to pack up and go at any time. So she bought herself a waterproof and a fireproof bag. And so all her important documents are in that bag and she can just grab and go if she needs to evacuate her home. We have a little less of uh, hurricanes to worry about here in upstate New York, but um, for some people that might be what how you choose to organize. Other folks are going to feel more comfortable with a lockbox, a safe deposit box, a filing cabinet, or just something under the bed, um, whatever works for you. Again, I just want to emphasize for you. So Wendy made a document for us um, called Finding the Documents You Need. And I emailed this out earlier today, um, but we also have it on uh, Google Drive. So Wendy's going to drop a link into the chat box so that you can access this on your internet browser and then download it and print it at home. Uh, so basically, the finding, finding the documents you need is um, a list of all the documents and where to find them. Uh, so on the first page of the document, there's you know a list of, um, actually, I'm going to back up and just say here on the le upper left quadrant, on, this is on the first page. So there's um, things that you keep in your home, things that are kept in the death binder, things that are kept in a safety deposit box, or D, things that are kept outside of the home. So you're basically taking all of your documents, everything that Wendy talked about, or that's on your list, and you're identifying where they can be found. Um, and then on the subsequent pages is a list of all of the, those documents, and you're basically just coding it. So, um, you know, funeral home information may be in the in your home, in the lockbox under the bed, so A1. So you're just developing a coding system for all of your documents. Um, and it'll probably make sense more when you, you download the document and open it for yourself. But it's a great way um, to keep everything organized and to record where they actually are. Uh, I would also just love to point out that this can be a very satisfying a benefit to working on your death binder is that you really get to go into all those files and papers that you've just been stuffing in the corner of your house or in the back of a closet and really prioritize what you need to keep and what you can get rid of. Um, and, you know, I just, I found this to be a very kind of satisfying uh, secondary benefit to the project and I'm sure others will too. So now we're going to change gears a little bit um, and do a little writing. So this is a, just an exercise to help you uh, instill some of the things that you're thinking about and uh, learning right now in the webinar. So we're just going to take the next five minutes or so, um, a minute or so per question, just to kind of brainstorm on a piece of paper. Or if you're with someone else, maybe you want to talk about it um, while being on mute. But this is just a time for you to process a little bit some of the things that are uh, you're excited about or maybe nervous about with the project. Move on to some next steps. Um, very practical next steps. You're gonna you're gonna start to gather your documents. You're gonna figure out how you want to organize them, as Sarah talked about. Um, another important piece to this process then is to talk to your loved ones 
as difficult as it may be. Um, but it also can be simple conversations just to say, I've started this um, and you can find it here. Um, and then overcome your own barriers. Uh, and then you're going to want to think about some questions. Here's some takeaway questions for you. What stops you from beginning? Do you have any barriers to starting this project? What are you afraid of? Fears, procrastination, time? Does it feel too overwhelming? Are there other things? And then of course, what can help you in overcoming these barriers so that you can move forward with this project? That you can do in the next week or so. Uh, so one example would be finding my passport, buying a binder, uh, talking to a loved one, right? So if anyone, everyone, you can just write down one thing, just a very um, simple statement, I will X, Y, Z set that intention for one thing that you can do reasonably, you know, in the next week without pulling your hair out, but that takes that first step to creating your binder. Coming, thank you to the library for hosting. Um, for questions, you can reach out at any time, whether it's about death finder, advanced care planning, or about our services. So our general email is info at hospicare.org. Our phone number is 272-0212. And we always say it's never too early to ask questions. We're here for you.